put some exercises into the slides, um, and when we get there, you can do them. I have put a bit of time for them in there, um, and afterwards we can go through it quickly. Um, okay. Um, I'm also copying uh, Jonathan's style with um, these uh, terminal and um, the slides on both sides. I hope you can read both um, because I quite like that. Um, the learning objectives for this course are, well, we, you should learn how to describe how the architecture of our scientific compute cluster is. Um, you should use how, uh, know how to use the module system to load software or use software and also go a bit into compiling software and different uh, with with uh, basically the, our basic build systems. Um, more uh, complex um, software building will be held, will be done afterwards using spec. Okay, first of all, the cluster overview. So what is an HPC cluster? Um, Julian already talked about it a bit. Essentially, we usually have a few blocks. So we have a few front ends where you can log in and work well interactively, like you SSH into it and edit your code and compile it and stuff like that. Um, then you have a whole bunch of nodes and this is where actually the work gets done. So we have like three front ends and 400 nodes. So the actual calculations happen on the compute nodes. Yeah, I should have written compute nodes, but well. Um, then there's also usually one or more file system, shared file systems, which are available on the compute nodes and on the um, front ends, where you can have your data and your programs and everything you need. Um, and um, what's special about these is in HPC s settings, these are usually very high performance file systems that can do massive parallel writing and reading at, uh, from multiple sources. You can overload them, but it's not that simple. Um, so yeah, these these are very specific HPC file systems. And last but not least, we also have a high speed network, um, which you usually don't have in a normal like data center. Um, we have the uh, Intel OmniPath, and for some some nodes also the uh, have InfiniBand, and these are used for uh, internet communication. So if you have a multi multi node job program, these can communicate, and also for storage access, for example. Um, so these are components that basically it's not only our system, but all HPC systems share essentially this, which sits, sets apart essentially from like a few Raspberry Pis I have at home and cluster together to a real HPC cluster. Um, yes, how is uh, this? So, wait, someone doesn't hear anything. I hope that is not the general case. Um, Okay, uh, I'll go on. Um, so this is how our network is set up. I think you already went into it a bit. So um, from the internet reachables on the login.gvdg.de. Um, this is our specific like gateway host. From there you can, if you're not in the GUNET or in Eduroam, you can then go to our front end. Um, and if you want to actually compute something, you need to interact with our batch system, which I will go into later today, not in this one. And this batch system then from, from that you can use to connect to the, or to send your jobs to the compute nodes. Um, okay, <clears throat> how is our uh, specific HPC center set up? We have two sites. Um, we have our modular data center, which is shortened the MDC. Um, and we have a second site at Fastbacks at the moment still. Um, this is about to move to the new data center at the uh, at the Burkhardtweg, our new GVDG data center. Um, but anyway, we're still in this configuration um, and we will still go, even after the move, we still have two sites. Um, so uh, we have in the modular data center, we have two front ends. We can reach it at login-mdc.hpc.gvdg.de. Um, this is essentially a round robin going to two um, these two hosts. They are called internally GWDU 101 and 102. You, you can see that if you connect, that's the host name. Um, and then there's a bunch of nodes in that data center Essentially everything starting with an A, AGQ nodes, AGT nodes, AMP, which is the main like normal partition. Um, these have the front ends and the nodes have uh, Intel Cascade Lake uh, CPUs and access to a file system called Scratch One. You should re remember it a bit because this is important on which 
file system you can work. If you uh, go to the Fastberg, there's our hardware that is a bit older. Um, it is at login dash fast and so on. Um, and has the host name uh, with a 103 in the end. And there's essentially everything starting with the D. DFA, DMP, DGE, DTE, and so on. And the rest is always a number. That's how our nodes are uh, named. These are uh, these use the Intel Broadwell architecture, and there's a scratch two file system. Um, you should always keep these two, like our two locations, in mind because somewhat sometimes you, if you don't do that, you could end up like you want to uh, work on one file system, but your job goes to the wrong site, and you can't really do anything. Um, okay. Now, uh, we come to the file systems. We have two file systems, two to three, uh, uh, um, let's say two main file system types. We have the home file storage and the scratch file storage. Um, as you already noticed from the slide before, we have actually two scratch file systems. So this is maybe not quite right, but um, the Two scratch file systems are very similar, whereas the home file system is quite different. Um, home, the home file system stores your permanent data. It is on all available on all nodes, so whatever you do, you will always have your home file system available. It is also available on um, on login.gwdg.de. Um, this stores your permanent data. It will not be erased. It has a backup mechanism, um, but on the other hand, there is a quota. So that means you can't um, just uh, store however much you like. Essentially, you run at some point you run into the, into the quota, and then you would you will get weird errors. So keep an eye on that. I will soon show you how to do that. Um, <clears throat> um, the other file system, as I mentioned already, is the scratch file system. Um, this is essentially um, data that you can store data there that is mainly used in projects or for specific compu computations. Um, it is very fast and very big, um, but you have to, you don't have a quota or something, but it also has no backup. So be aware of that if you want to like if you want to have your data for a longer time period, that might not be the right place for it. And uh, you see, I, I said here like this is fast, um, which brings up the question: Is this then slow, the the home file system? And yes, comparably, if you can, uh, if you have lots of um, data access, uh, it is a good idea to use a scratch file system or even other file systems um, because the home storage is rather slow. Um, okay, I've already mentioned quotas, and um, quotas are set for each user on the home file system. Um, and you can use a um, a command to check your quota, which is helpful. So you can, as as it's written here, you can SSH into the system. Uh, I'll take this specific note. You can use any you want um, and type in quota. And then it will just, I really love it when everything works. Um, then it should usually display your Quota and for some reason I have a bug. I hope you don't have it at the moment. I think I screwed something up with my SSH key forwarding, so I can't really see my quota now. I hope you can. If not, well, that's um, th 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 that would be bad. Um, anyway, uh, let's come to the the next one. So usually you would see something like uh, like like this. So we have lots of different um, home file systems, and you're um, your home directory is one of one of these file systems, and you can essentially see uh, something like your file system name. It's in this case, uh, UNE05, UNI, and you have your use, your soft limit, and your hard limit. And um, use, it's, it's all in kilobytes, which is a bit annoying, but because it's big numbers, but well, we can deal with that. And you can see what you've used, your soft limit, which if you reach that, um, some operations will not work anymore. Um, so then you have the first errors. So try not even to reach that one. And then you have the hard limit, which is significantly higher. But if you reach that one, nothing works anymore. And you might not even be able to log in, because if you log in, it usually the bash tries to write some files, and that will fail. And 
it's hard to find out what's going wrong. So keep an eye on your quota. Um, as I already mentioned, Scratch has no quota. Um, although our uh, our storage is obviously limited by the amount of storage phys we physically have. So if I type DF and Scratch, you can see we have, let's add a human readable flag. We have uh, two petabytes and Currently, we still have 1.1 petabytes available, but please don't fill up 1.1 petabytes all by yourself because that would not be nice to other users. Um, okay. Then we have another uh, file system which is mainly available on the compute nodes. So we will learn a bit more about that later when we can actually use the, com the compute nodes. Um, but this is a local file system, which means it's only on this node. And it's usually, no, it's always SSDs. So it's pretty fast. Um, you can use it for temporal data on your, uh, for your, for your calculations. So many, um, many softwares use temporary data. And, um, this is rather, uh, <clears throat> so if you use an SSD, um, it is definitely faster than using home and usually also faster than using um, temp. Um, the problem is it's not in, depending on the node, it is rather small. I think the newer nodes have actually quite big um, SSDs, but I mean, big, what is big? If you have a terabyte of data, it won't fit on the SSD. So you have to think about like, where, if you can use it, you have to look at the node, if it's enough space, or if it isn't enough space, you might need to use the, uh, the scratch file system. So be aware that it's there, and if you can use it, it's usually the best option, but if you can't use it, well, that happens. Um, and the third slash fourth, I'm not quite sure where I am now, um, location to store data, the file system is our archive. This is, well, it's, it's, an, it's a tape archive, so it's, um, for data that you want to store, which will not be deleted like ever. We need to like multiple data centers to burn down until this is lost. So um, it should be, no, I think only anyway. Um, it is very safe. Uh, you can put loads of data there because tape is extremely cheap. Um, and you also, you automatically get uh, an archive at this path at user users slash a slash username and this path is saved in your a home variable so a is users essentially what I what I just said over there um, what uh, the problem with tape or not the problem one feature let's call it that of tape is that you um, need you should First of all, um, tape doesn't handle many small files very well, so you should put all of that into an archive and you should compress it. Tape does some internal pro um, compression as, as well, but it's a good idea to actually compress it yourself with a better, uh, or with a maybe better uh, algorithm. Um, so what you should do is you learned a bit about um, uh, well, at least Jonathan men mentioned the uh, tar command. So what you can do is essentially say, okay, tar, and then create, uh, compress, that's just verb verbosity, and save it into your a home variable and data. Um, and this would, for example, archive the directory data and put it on your archive. So as an archive, as in using tar, it, was, it would tar and zip your data directory and copy it to the GVDG archives. You can also use this, which um, essentially tells uh, the tar that it should use the pigs library, which is essentially uh, parallelized um, compression. If you have a large data set, it is really speeding things up. Um, okay. Now, I want you to do something because me talking all the time is kind of boring. Um, please connect to the front ends. I mean, I guess most of you are already. Check out your home quota, check the storage, uh, scratch file systems, um, take a look at how big they are and how much space is currently available. Um, and 
um, answer me essentially this question. Like, uh, if you downloaded a big genome database, this is just an example, but for, for say you have a big genome database, like 100 gigabytes, where would you store it? On which file system? Um, and the last thing is um, create a project directory on Scratch, like in your Scratch folder in your of your user, and add a random file into that, put something into the file, and compress the folder and send it to the archive. Um, yeah, I'll give you around 10 minutes. I hope that is fine. I've never done these slides before, so I can't really tell. Um, but um, I'm happy if you give some feedback in the chat so I know how far you are. In the meantime, yeah, well, have fun with it. I'll be here in this room to answer questions if there are any. <laughs> I'm uh, not quite sure how well the time of everything fits. Um, okay. And if you have still questions, you can ask them in your rooms and the tutors and everything. So um, I will go on. Um, <clears throat> so how does a usual workflow with a Scratch file system works? Um, as mentioned, it's not a permanent storage. So essentially what you usually do is you have your, um, your directory as Scratch users, your user, and then you just create a project directory there, copy the necessary data there, run everything you want to run. Um, you save the results you still need to somewhere more safe, for example, your home directory. Delete everything that you don't need, because sometimes stuff gets left behind there. And since there is no automatic deletion, um, it would be nice if you delete it. And um, maybe if you have some stuff that you don't need anymore, um, you can just copy it to the archive archive it and remove the project directory in the end. So you don't have data lying around there for ages. Um, okay, that much for the Scratch file system or the file systems in general. 
there are a bit more like <laughs> We could talk hours about file systems and about how to, con to correctly use them, but this would kind of be too much for this uh, session. So um, if you are more interested in that, um, be sure to, uh, we have uh, a talk, we had a talk about that um, in the HPC coffee and uh, maybe some of my colleagues can link the talk, the file system talk here if you're actually more interested in how to use our file systems correctly. Um, now, um, to, how do how do we actually get our data from the system to the uh, f from your desktop or file system, whatever you have, um, to the HPC? Um, we have three machines that are dedicated to that. We have transfer, uh, which is world reachable, so it's not like the our front end, so you can reach from everywhere, but only home is mounted there. And then we have transfer-mdc and transfer-fas, which essentially are um, not, with, it, these are only reachable from, from the GUNET, so you need to be in Edurome or in the GUNET or in the VPN to reach them. But these have home and scratch, or in, the, in this case, scra uh, scratch 2 mounted. Um, and if you connect to this one, you will notice it's essentially just GWDU103. So you already need that, uh, know that one. Um, um, <clears throat> sorry, I was distracted. Um, okay. And how to actually transfer it now or something. So there is, I'm not sure because I couldn't be there all the time. I'm not sure if um, uh, Jonathan already talked about that, but uh, there are different um, possibilities to transfer data. You can use SCP, which essentially um, you can use to transfer data from a source directory to the to your user on this machine into this destination directory. To do that, oh, damn it! Um, I have nothing prepared, which is great. Uh, let's we go to some temporary directory and to file one, oh, even a typo, and this one into file two. So I now have two files which have timestamps in them. Great. And now I want to copy, for example, SCP. Uh, I wanted to type file, but I didn't manage it. To emboden at transfer dot in my home directory. If I do just the colon, it's um, going to be uh, the home directory, and it should now try that. It asks me for my key because I've everything set up in such a way. And now if I connect to one of the front ends, I can see the file. So do this. So the file is in my home directory. Um, why does it reset all the time? Um, you have also more possibilities. Um, you can play around with SCB a bit. It's, uh, it has lots of lots of options you can use. Um, if you want to transfer it back, as it's mentioned here, you can you say, okay, I want to have from here this file or directory to this target. Um, then, um, besides that, there's also uh, um, GUI option, so that you have a graphical user interface if you're not that familiar with the command line yet and don't have time to learn everything, which I get. Um, then you can use FileZilla. Um, why File, FileZilla? It works on all platforms. It has a GUI and it's open source. But there's also other stuff like WinSCP, which only works on Windows, as the name suggests, but also, it's also widely used on our systems. Um, but I mentioned FileZilla, as I said, because it works on all platforms, so I only have to write one documentation. And then there's also rsync, which is essentially can is remote sync, I think it stands for, so synchronize remote files, which is similar to SCP as it uh, is a command line tool to copy data over. So I could do something like rsync, sync dash, uh, yeah, let's, let's lose, use exactly what's mentioned here, which is essentially archive mode. So it copies the file permission, every, 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 a lot of file data with it, uh, very verbose and human readable. And let's say I want to have everything from my current directive to Borden at 
Oh, no, I wanted to use a transfer. Transfer dash MDC this time. Nope. And now I try to uh, to do the auto completion with with the wrong argument. It tries to yeah. Uh, HPC dot GWDD. Right, and now he copied both files over. I could go back again to. And both files are here. And again, if I turn that around, I no idea what that is. Um, I can turn that around and say, OK, I want to copy a file from here. I'll do this one again, but to here, which would then check, OK. Ah, yeah, that's the thing about rsync. It doesn't. If, if the file is already there and it's, it's the same file, don't ask how it knows that. Um, it will not uh, if, copy the file again. So here it says file A is up to date. So it's already there. It doesn't copy it back. If I remove it and do it again, it should copy the file. And I have file R back. <clears throat> now. Um, this is for file transfer and file systems. Uh, now we come to the second part, uh, namely modules and containers. Um, Jonathan always already talked about um, a bit like how to compile and also uh, talked very short, like showed a very basic example of make files, um, and also mentioned the package manager. Uh, and you also mentioned that you can't use it here. That is correct. You need to be root to use a packet manager. So um, how do you actually get your software if it's not already installed? And that's um, essentially where the module system comes in. So the problem is HPC systems in generally do not rely on the package manager because we have a rather huge ecosystem of complex software that is like people need different versions of different softwares and these different softwares or different versions of softwares need different uh, compilers and different libraries and it's all just a huge mess. You can't have all that installed in one single package manager because for example yum apt and whatever you want to use, um, pacman if you're an Arch Linux guy, um, these can only install one version of a software and that will never be enough on an HPC system and you could then say like, okay, then the user should compile their own software. But the problem here is um, it is complicated. It is sometimes very complicated to have a, like a complex software that you can compile yourself. And not every of our, uh, not all of our users are uh, already ex experts, which is fine. So our solution is uh, we compile or install uh, softwares that are necessary, not all of them, but most of them, some are very easy to install for users themselves. So if only one user needs a very easy to install software, they can just install it, co compile it themselves in their home directory. But um, for more complex examples, uh, we will do that. And then we make use of the software called modules, which is a way to make them available to the users, like beside the packet manager. So how does this work? Um, Okay, I'm not going to go too much into detail how this works, but I'm going to uh, go into detail on how to use it. You can use the module command to interact with the module system. So far, so obvious. Um, with module avail, you can see which... Oh, I'm not connected to the system. What a shame. But with module avail, you can see all the modules. You have a bunch of core modules and... Uh, compiled with a specific compiler and so on and so on. You have uh, a whole bunch of bioinformatics modules, which are a lot, chemistry, mathematics. So we have like, these are all different softwares we've, we've installed. And you can already see that it's like, there's lots of software in multiple versions available. We have a bunch of different MATLAB versions. We have different Python Anaconda environments. We have CUDA in six different versions. So you can see there's a lot of, uh, stuff available and uh, the D behind that means usually that you this is the default version 
So if you want to load something, for example, what do I want to load? I want to load the CUDA environment. And then I can just type module load and then go for software and version. In this case, CUDA slash 11.5.1. And it loads it. I can now type module list to see. Currently loaded modules, that one. Um, I could also just, oh yeah, and if you don't want it anymore, if you want to get rid of this, you can say unload and say CUDA this, and it's gone again. Now, module list, no modules loaded. Um, as I mentioned, like two minutes earlier, there is the D that stands for default. So if I say, for example, uh, module avail, and what you can do is give a keyword and say module avail Python. What kind of Python do we have here? We have 3.8.6 and 3.9, and this is the default version. Okay, let's say I just type module load. Oh, just to sh show you that it actually works, I'm going to show you what Python version. This is the default one, 2.7.5. I think that's out of service since 2020, so very old. Now I say module load Python. It loads the default module, which should be 3.9.0. And I type Python dash dash version again. And I have this version of Python installed. Um, oh yeah, and last but not least, I, it's on the slides. Um, module purge unloads all modules without you having to say everything. So module purge, then I can do this again and see, I'm back to 2.7.5. Um, what happens here internally is um, there are environment variables in, in the bash shell that say where the programs where the shell should look for installed programs. It's called the path and the, the path variable and for, for example, manual uh, pages, there's the man path. Uh, and there's a bunch of extra stuff going on there. Um, what actually happens here is um, the module sets a lot of these paths to, add, adds extra paths to these paths so that this shell now looks into more places. So I can do something like echo, path. Where do I look? I look, okay, I've set it up in the way that it looks here, but usually you go to something like um, user local bin, um, this one, user bin, user local s bin, user s bin. These are the standard paths that people, uh, like that modules that the shell looks for. And if I now say module load Python again and do echo path, I can see what was added uh, this large uh, path, which is where Python is installed. So this is how my shell now knows that if I type Python, I want to have the newer version. Um, right, there's also, um, we have some softwares are um, compiled for specific, uh, for specific CPU architectures. We have Cascade Lake and Haswell, Broad, Broadwell, Haswell, I'm, it says Haswell, so I'm going with that. Um, and you can see for, for ex one, one example of these is, um, is the Gromex. So if you go for uh, module what is, which gives a short summary of the module, is you can see, first of all, bit of meta information like name, version, the target. This is the Cascade Lake. As you might remember, um, all our new nodes have Cascade Lake uh, GPUs, so this is uh, CPU, so this is perfect if you run on, if you, if you want to run on this. But if you get onto the older nodes, you might get problems because you, this was um, compiled for Cascade Lake, but the older are Broadwell or Haswell. So they might crash and give you some weird errors. In that case, you might want to go to the older, so to this one. Nothing works today. This is great. Um, to this one and say the same thing I said here. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, the Fassberg, the location has the older architecture. If I do that here, it should now say target Haswell. So, um, 
this way you can make sure, okay, uh, if I run onto older, on older nodes, I will go from here and uh, have the right uh, art target architecture in mind. Um, and this, so much for the module system. Uh, next would be um, singularity containers. Um, you might heard about, have heard about, I mean, by, by now, many people that l at least uh, work with Linux lots of times have heard about doc uh, containers, for example, Docker. But if you haven't, no problem. It's essentially one way to uh, have a, to encapsulate um, applications into, well, a, a small container. That's the name of the, the idea. It's like containers. Um, and these run on any system independent of the uh, rest of the uh, operating system. So essentially, you can run, run it everywhere. It can run on the newer nodes, on the older nodes, as long as the uh, container runtime is installed. Um, the container runtime, in our case, is Singularity. Um, it is similar to Docker, which is the most well-known one. Um, but there are uh, some security issues with Docker, which is why we don't use it. Um, now, to use it, you need to load the Singularity module. Load Singularity. And then you can essentially, I think I have some. Never mind. Um, you can, you, uh, you have now the Singularity uh, command line. Uh, the singularity command on command line, singularity dash dash version, I hope that works, yep, 3.8.5. And then you can either um, run singularity containers, which you can uh, can find online. So some, some uh, software packages provide Docker or singularity images, so you can download them, or there are registries, the Docker registry and a singularity registry. If you don't know what that is you will you can you can google a bit for it and you, then you will find out like they, okay there's a public docker registry where all these different containers are uh, available so if i want to run this i it will download it, it will try to run this container from the uh, official singularity registry you can do that and it takes a moment, it gives you some information you can for now ignore and runs the lol cow, which is a, well, that. Um, and this is essentially would work on basically anything. Uh, of course, this is just a small example, but you can also package huge applications into containers and this makes it sometimes a lot easier to run it on HPC systems. Okay. Um, I still have 15 minutes. That should actually work out, Ooh, although close. No, let's do rather. Do, if you if you have time to run that, um, you you can do that essentially at the side because I'd rather go to my slides first, and uh, then have the exercises if we still have time in the end. So I'll now go through the next part. But if you have time on the side, you can just try out Singularity and have a look at the module system. Um, Right, because the next part might be actually interesting because it's about compiling your own software and some people just do like to compile their own software. Um, so what, what does it actually mean? Okay, let's start there. Uh, essentially, um, you create, if you compile a software, you create one single or multiple executables or a library if you are into that, kind, uh, if, if, you, if you want to compile a library. Uh, an executable is usually something you can run. A library is something you can use in other executables. Um, and you compile it from the source code. So essentially you get the whatever language, for example, C or C++, Rust, Go, whatever you like. Um, and you do some steps and in the end, you from the code, you get an executable. Um, we cannot install all software, as I already mentioned, and often also scientific software is just published as source code, not as binaries for every system, because that's a lot of work. And um, oftentimes, if you, uh, a pre-compiled binary that is basically w works on every system has the downside that it has to make, uh, it, it's like, it can't be as good on the specific performance. So, so you can get better performance if you directly compile it on the hardware you want to run it on. Um, so it's sometimes it's better to just compile the system uh, software yourself. And uh, 
so it's perfectly set up for your um for for your architecture um Yes, and in many cases, like with apt and yum and stuff like that, you need to be actually the system administrator, the root, to install something. So that's why we can compile software. How does it work? Essentially, uh, we, there are a few things you should follow. Um, and I'll do this as examples. Um, first of all, uh, it's a good idea to create, like, first uh, directory where you want to put your software. I've already did this, but not on this machine. Interesting. Every time I log out, it goes back. Oh, I didn't know that this terminal does that. Um, I've already created a file in Scratch. And I think it's Right, I created, uh, and I already downloaded the software, so well, we don't need to do that anymore. Um, usually I uh, start by creating a directory, and then I download the software with wget, for example, and next would, one would be to um, extract the software. So, how does it work? Uh, you don't need all the extra stuff. It's, this should alone be enough. And, um, Takes a moment. So what you can see, what what am I uh, doing? I'm building my own grep. I mean, I'm not sure if you had, um, if you talked about grep, but grep is quite a useful tool. And our grep version, for example, is, if, I don't know if, it's not really useful to combine grep yourself. I just needed an example. So you can see we have a version from, I guess, 2014, uh, 20.2, and I, I downloaded beforehand uh, with wget, um, yeah, com compile nano is the exercise, Jonathan. We come to that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so we have a newer version here. So now I can see, okay, it installed it into grep 3.7, uh, unpacked it, and what do I see here? Just a bunch of files. Um, the code will be in usually in SR in source, and if you want to look at it, I mean, sure, why not? Take a look at grep. <laughs> grab.c and you can see the actual C code that is grab. Um, not that interested in that, but what you, um, but yeah, that's, that, that's the source code. And now the usual way of building, like the, uh, the, the standard way uh, of, of doing something like that is to run configure, then make, and then make install. Sometimes you don't need make or, or make check to make some specific check. Uh, install installs it to a specific point. Um, what is the, the nice thing here is that you can usually give configure a prefix and uh, then it installs it to that directory, which is extremely helpful because you can then install, install it into a directory where you have actually write access to because usually configure installs it to slash user where you need to be root. So what I'm going to do is go one down and create a build directory and an install directory. Uh, and we'll go to the build directory and now I can essentially, so what, um, you don't need a build directory, but I, you, I, I do like to use it. Um, now I can say, okay, how about I run, uh, what was it, grab and then configure. I can first can take a look at what I can do, and it will give me all the options there are. There's a whole bunch of it, as you can see. I'm not going to go through, go through all of this. What we actually need is the prefix, which is mentioned here. By default, make install, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I'm going to do prefix equals, and then essentially this one just with install in the end, and I'm going to run it. And now, what is it doing? It's checking for a whole bunch of different libraries, if they are there, and depending on the library, it, it builds specific, a specific version of it. So if, it, if grep has, for example, some compression reading capabilities, but you don't, if you, if you want them, but you don't have a compression library installed, it will not install it. If you have it installed, it will add that feature. So essentially, it now builds a, uh, a version of the software based on the capabilities your system have has. 
Um, and then it hangs. No, okay, it goes on. This, by the way, is now not compiling. This is only essentially doing the pre-compilation step. It checks what's there and what it can do and generates some specific files. It generates all of that in the build directory. You can see now there's a bunch of stuff in here. Um, and this now has the nice thing, if I, if I want to throw away everything but not the source, I can just remove the build directory, which is why I usually use a build directory. Um, I can now use make. Um, if I will do it for uh, for sake of, um, of 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 time. I will do it with multiple with with J. You can use multiple threads at once. Please do not all use J, J five or something. Just keep it as make if you try it out later yourself, because otherwise our friend end will be overloaded. And I haven't shown you how to use the compute node yet. So I'll do this, and hopefully that won't take too much time. And it's done. And I can do make install. And it installed everything into install. Let's see. We have bin and share. And in share usually is the, the manual files. And in bin now should be ah, bin grep version. And we can see we have get crep 3.7 installed right here. Um, yeah, that is an example of how you um, compile a simple piece of software. I already, yeah, I, I, I already showed all like most of this. Uh, what you can do now, it's, it's in this directory, you could, for example, this is what happens here. So we have created some software, did make install. And if you, you could, for example, designate a specific um, folder in your, uh, in your home directory where all these binaries are. So you don't have to give the whole way. Because if I now do something like that and say grep dash dash version, it still uses the system one, the 2.2. What I want to have is essentially this one uh, with bin and grep. But this is quite like I don't always want to give this long path, so I could put it into uh, link it into a specific directory. In my case, I've created something like that in local bin. This is in my path, and I could do and dash s a symbolic link to from here to here. And now, if I say grab dash dash version, it's still the wrong one. God damn it! <laughs> I like when something I didn't test doesn't work. Could be here now. Check that. Okay, not quite sure why it does not work at the moment. Maybe I need to re-log in. I'm, uh, but I'm also soon out of time, so I'm not going to uh, investigate that too deeply. Yes, of course, you can also do an alias. That's a good idea. Uh, the easier one, the, the, the cheap solution, and say grep is in this one. That should actually work now. Now, now it points to the right direction. Um, Good idea, Jonathan. Um, okay. Right. Uh, what I haven't told you about right now is um, I, I've used the standard compiler, GCC, which is also ancient from 2015, which is because we have like sci uh, scientific Linux, which even doesn't exist anymore. It's quite ancient. Um, you can, for example, use a more modern one, then you might get some more features. If you want to have the GCC, now I have yes, stop being so annoying. Now I have a more recent compiler. What I could also do is, um, for example, use the, in, uh, the Intel compilers. Um, Intel uh, has a bit more uh, a few more uh, is usually a bit faster, especially for if you have like very 
fast code. Uh, you need your code to be very fast, which is not the case with Grab. Um, but then you can use Intel because we also have in Intel um, architectures. So Intel is usually a bit faster in that. So you can load module, load Intel, and oh God, I think they're now, yeah, one API. PI slash compilers. And now I, ha, ah, uh, our module system is in intelligent. Noticed I already have GCC loaded, but now uh, it loaded Intel 1 API. And now I can use the Intel compilers, which are called ICC. I have this one. Um, to use them correctly in, in configure, you need to export these variables. These tell essentially uh, configure where to look for, for compilers. Um, or maybe it is done already by the module. I think, no, it isn't too bad. So you have to do it. You might have to do it yourself. Um, and one small callback back to the modules. We have some modules that are only visible if you have loaded the Intel 1 API compiler. These are now at the top and say like, okay, these, for example, this open blast, which is a basic linear algebra, what is S standing for? I'm, I forgot it, solutions, I don't know. A basic linear algebra uh, library, um, which is compiled now with the 1 API compiler, which means that if you want to use this blast version, you should also use the Intel compiler with it. So there are some specifically, some versions of software specifically for one or the other, ah, basic linear algebra subprograms. That's that makes more sense. Um, that are specifically for one compiler or the other, and they will only show up if you have like the Intel compiler loaded. Okay. Um, yes, there's ah. Um, running out of time, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. There's also the Intel math kernel library, which optimizes specific um, libraries for the Intel architecture. So Intel has some very specific features that you can use only with Intel processors and only with the Intel compiler, but it's very fast. For example, uh, optimized linear algebra and uh, Fourier transfer transform functions. Um, to do that, since I only have 30 seconds left, you can have a look here how to actually do that. This is a essentially a recipe for that. And here's an exercise with, to which which you can do in your free time the, for, in the next break. I'm not sure. Um, which essentially uh, is about what I just did with Grep, but try it with Nano. Nano, you can easily find online the source, download it, extract it, create a build directory, configure your own prefix, compile it and install it, and then run the newer Nano. And the Nano made a lot of progress in the in the time. Um, okay, this is all I have. I had to rush a bit through it. Sorry, there wasn't that much time for exercises as I thought there will, will be. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to be in one of the rooms. Um, but for now, I think I will give over to uh, Laura because she 